Hello, everyone. I am here to talk to you about the great concurrency SmackDown, JDK versus Zio. In my presentation, equipped with cheesy boxing graphics. If you don't like this title, though, I have a backup for you. What Oracle doesn't want you to know about Loom. And, and actually, more to the point, I think this is a really good title right here. Like, is there life after Loom for functional effect systems? I got this, the idea for this talk, one week, I think, or period of a couple days when I spent entirely too much time on contributors Scala Lang, debating Loom and functional effect systems and whether we should bring Kotlin Suspend to Scala and all sorts of other things. And there's a number of people on that thread who were like, hey, when Loom comes along, bye-bye Zio, bye-bye Cat's Effect, bye-bye Monix, we won't need any of that stuff anymore. We're just gonna go back to JDK programming. And that's kind of annoying. <laughs> it's not that like, okay, if it's true, it's true, right? But it's kind of annoying because functional effect systems are about more than just async programming. They're actually async plus concurrent programming. From day one, Zio's web page went up and it was, Zio is a library for async and concurrent programming. Async and concurrent programming. Again and again, I say async and concurrent programming. Loom comes along and solves async programming and we're still left with concurrent programming. So hence, today, my presentation, the great concurrency smackdown. Is there a life after Loom for functional effect systems? Now, why do I say JDK versus Zio? Because Loom itself, it gives you asynchronicity, gives you virtual threads. And some would say it gives you JEP 428, that's the Java, or Java Enhancement Process 428, which is an attempt to imbue the JDK with something called structured concurrency. But even if you look at everything in JEP 428 and, and Loom proper virtual threads, the number of problems in concurrency you can solve is still relatively small. So in order to sort of beef up the, the amount of material I have to work with, I decided to include not just Loom, not just JEP 428, but every single tool inside Java Util Concurrent and see how that stacks up against Zio. So I've structured this into 10 rounds, and I have <laughs> 120 slides. I'm gonna go fast. It is a boxing match, after all. We've, we've gotta get to 10 rounds. And I'll let you decide who wins every round, okay? If you think JDK wins, then you shout JDK, JDK. No judgment from me, uh, by the way. <laughs> I think JDK wins some of these rounds. And on the other hand, if you think Zio wins, well, shout out Zio. Scalability. So back in the old days of programming, we ran CGI scripts on servers that maybe satisfied one or two requests per second. Because no one was using the internet in those days, and almost nothing was on the internet. And in this day and age, of course, everyone is glued to their phones and their computers and their other devices 24-7, network is everywhere, and our servers need to handle tens of thousands of concurrent requests per second on a single machine many times. That's the norm. Highly scalable cloud systems is the norm these days. It's not the exception. And the way we like to program in a web server model or really anywhere at all is uh, sequentially using imperative programming. It's do this and do this. It's like decode the request, check the cache, query the database, call some cloud API, and then build the response. Fundamentally, the nature of handling a request or a new element of input data is sequential. And as a result, it's a very good fit for threaded programming. Threaded programming is just, when you have a thread, you execute a series, series of instructions step by step, one after the other. That's what threaded programming is all about. And so it's a great model, and in order to achieve massive scalability required of our modern web servers, we just scale horizontally. And we say, okay, well, every in incoming connection or every incoming element from a Kafka queue or whatever, every partition of data will just have its 
uh, logic handled by another thread. And that raises uh, a big problem over in the world of the JVM because threads are not cheap resources. Right? Threads are very expensive. And, and there's stack space, there's JVM metadata, there's information located at the level of the operating system. Every thread becomes a new route for garbage collection. This is some serious resources uh, that happen every single time you create a new thread on the JVM. And not only do you have the overhead of actually allocating the thread, of allocating stack space, clearing the memory to zero, and creating all this other stuff, and acquiring locks and whatnot, but then once the thread is created and even stuck into a pool, the actual existence of the thread imposes quite a few different forms of overhead on your application. And that's because the operating system is involved in the context switch that happens when it has to divide your four CPUs or you know, four cores or 32 cores, whatever it is, amongst the tens of thousands of threads that are executing on your operating system. And every time a context switch happens, basically the state of the CPU has to be saved, has to be saved to the heap. And then um, the kernel, the kernel scheduler has to be restored so it can take over and it can figure out what to execute next. And after it figure out what to execute next, it has to make a decision, it has to save its state back to heap and restore the state of the thread. All of that takes time. And because of this, there was something called the, the C take 10K uh, barrier, which was uh, happened, I, I don't know exactly how long ago, but probably at least 10 years ago, where people found that web servers were simply not scaling as much as we needed them to scale. We want one thread per incoming connection because that's the way we like to program. We want to do this and do this and do this for every incoming request. But at the same time, creating threads on the JVM was actually quite expensive. We couldn't afford to do it. And that led to the 10K problem, or, or yeah, the C10K uh, problem, which led to the existence of reactive programming, async programming, callback hell, all basically different names for the same thing, and functional effect systems, and also future. All of these things try to, more or less, you have to squint your eyes to see this. This is not obvious, but if you squint your eyes, all of these different things reinvent the concept of a thread in library space, in user land space. And they allow you to achieve the sorts of highly scalable concurrency you need to build modern cloud-native applications. And so this led to things like Zio and Monix and, and Cat's Effect, where we, ha we have something, basically a virtual thread. Zio calls them fibers, but basically they're, they're like a thread in every way. And you can create huge numbers of these things on a single machine. Forget about 10,000. You can create 100,000, even a million of these things. And because they're so efficient and consume just a tiny amount of memory, because they use different techniques and the operating system is not involved in context switching between those, there's no operating system resources involved at all, we're able to achieve the scalability necessary to power modern day systems in virtual threads implemented in libraries like Zio. And this is the aspect that Loom comes along and it totally changes the game. Why? Because Loom said, well, rather than subjecting people to callback hell and reactive extensions for Java and yes, monads and all this other stuff till the end of time, why don't we just fix the root cause of the problem? And what is the root cause of the problem? We can't have too many threads, right? It's, it's too expensive. So what Loom does is it gives us this thing called a virtual thread that's very, very cheap to create and context switch between. And that enables us to have 10,000 or 100,000 or even a million of these things inside our application without having to worry. So it solves the root cause of the problem that led to the introduction of reactive programming, async programming, callback-based programming, effect systems and, and future and all of that stuff out there is obviated. It's, it's, its primary reason for existence becomes obviated by the advent of Loom. And this is how easy it is. In JDK 19, if you've enabled experimental preview mode, you can create these virtual threads so easily. It's thread.start virtual thread. 
Okay? And you can do that as many times as you want. This is an ordinary for loop that loops for 100,000 times and spins up 100,000 threads that do nothing. And this works. Try to do that with real threads. <laughs> that will not work so well. That, that will go quite wrong. But with virtual threads and Loom, it's just amazing. And they, they could have done this in multiple ways. The way they chose to do this in Loom is actually quite clever. They just reused the thread data type. Right? They re, reused the thread data type, all the same stuff that you know. If you've done any programming with Java or on the JVM, you know thread. You know all of its methods, what they do, the semantics of these methods. They just reused it all. They weren't going to do that initially. They were going to introduce something called a fiber or a continuation, and they experimented you know, back and forth. And in the end, they settled on what is quite possibly the best way to retrofit a programming language like Java with virtual threads. It's amazing. It's brilliant. And so what are the, what are the trade offs? Well, with Loom, it's direct style, direct style programming. And we all know direct style programming. It's what we, most of us grew up on. And we don't have to change any bit of code, right? All the code out there, the old-fashioned code that doesn't use async, doesn't use callbacks, just becomes magically faster and more scalable. Fantastic. JDBC, we don't need async JDBC. The old JDBC, as bad, bad as it is for other reasons, is actually good enough for performance reasons, for scalability reasons. So it's great, fantastic, non-disruptive. It's a disruptive, it's a non-disruptive disruptive innovation in the sense that it's disruptive in one way, but not in the way that it poorly integrates with everything you have. Great performance. Um, there are some pros and cons. Uh, I I've, have seen some benchmarks uh, comparing it very favorably to, for example, Kotlin, Kotlin coroutines and so forth. I think the jury is still out on the scenarios in which virtual threads perform really well and the ones in which they have problems. But one thing is certain, this is baked into the Java virtual machine, right? It's, it's not going anywhere. And problems that are identified will probably be fixed. And it's going to get faster and faster over time. There's no backing out Loom. <laughs> Loom is altering the course of history on the JVM forever. On the other hand, the only really drawback that I can think of is um, it doesn't really help you with things like Scala Native or Scala JS. Zero help there. And uh, it's obviously only useful if you can convince your pointy-haired boss to upgrade to JDK 19 plus. And, and you probably can. Maybe not this year. Maybe not next year, but five years from now, yeah, for sure. And Zio, on the other hand, you know, it's not really useful for legacy code. It's not going to make all your existing code more scalable, your concurrent code more scalable, right? You, you program in the Zio style, which, as some people have pointed out, is its own language, pretty much. And the functional style isn't free. As you heard from Flavio, allocations have cost, right? There's some performance overhead that goes into creating a library like Zio that allows you to program in a purely functional style. Um, but the, the pro is it, it sort of works before Loom as well as after Loom and works on other platforms like JavaScript and, and native. So for async programming, what do you think? Loom or JDK or Zio? JDK. JDK. I'm right there with you. JDK. JDK wins this round for sure. And we've got to give the JDK something in these early rounds. <laughs> All right, resources. So let's take a look at resource management, which actually is connected to both asynchronicity and concurrency in, in ways that I'm going to explain. So Java has this really great construct called try finally, or try with resources is sort of the resourceful specialization of try finally. And what code like this does is it basically allows you to create, create something and then inside the block, when the block exits, the, um, a close method will be called on the auto-closable interface that file input stream and many other data types in Java implement. And this provides you the guarantee that if the operation to create the resource succeeds, then for sure, without a doubt, and under all possible circumstances, really, literally, doesn't matter what sort of exception is thrown from the body there, the uh, finalizer, which is the close method on the file input stream, will definitely be invoked. 
This allows us to build resource safe applications. And in Loom, the great news is that all of this works through, um, through code. We, we would have used to call it async code, non-blocking code, code that does not block operating system level threads. It's gonna work. So you can have async suspension, basically, in that try block, it doesn't matter. The guarantees that you get for resource safety will continue to survive thanks to Loom. And Zio's Alternative here is, in ZO2 anyway, it's this thing called scoped. Basically, when you open resources, it adds a scope, uh, a requirement for a scope to the environment. And then you can give it that scope and sort of close the scope at the same time using ZO scoped operator. And on, like, first glance, it, it looks like ZO doesn't really provide any compelling benefits. It's a different syntax, right? Different, and different syntax, people don't like learning new things. They like what they already know. And so here we've got familiar try finally, which exists in probably every programming language known to man, except for the, the weird functional ones and, and maybe the logic ones. And then we've got some novel thing with scopes and whatnot that truly is novel, by the way. It did not come from Haskell. That's uh, Zio original, so to speak. So it seems like maybe JDK wins this round, maybe. But let's spend a few more moments pushing that and, and see where it leads. What if we need to acquire two things, two resources, and also have the guarantee to release them both? What do we do? Well, the obvious thing turns out to work. We just nest them. And now, for sure, it doesn't matter where inside this code it fails, whether it fails in the first try or the second try or in the bodies of either, anything that was acquired will in fact be released. That's great. But you, you can sort of see a little bit of a problem creeping in. And that is what happens if we have three or four or five resources, we enter something I might call try hell. <laughs> Loom, Loom saves you from callback hell, right? This is a form of resource hell, try hell. And actually it's, it's even more, okay, this is in, inconvenient, maybe, especially when you contrast it with the Zia way of solving things. Because things don't get more nested. It doesn't matter how many things you open up. Your code remains perfectly flat. But actually, it points the way to a much more fundamental, severe limitation of try. Uh, try with resources or try finally. And that is, it only works when the number of Resources is statically known. There's static topology of resource allocation and deallocation. And that's because try finally, this is a lexical construct, right? There's syntax associated. It's not a programmatic value-based construct. There's try finally are its own syntax. So you can nest the try finally in the try finally and whatnot all the way down. But fundamentally, the number of try finalings is going to be determined by your source code program. It's going to be fixed. It's not going to be variable length. So if I want to open all of these paths at, at one, you know, open all of them and do a merge sort on their contents, right, which requires me have all of them open at once, but also if anything goes wrong opening some of these files, then I have to shut everything down. Or if as I'm reading from the files and doing my merge sort, if there's a problem, then I also have to shut everything down. You can't write that code using try finally. Actually, there's a hack that will, uh, I'll tell you what the hack is, but it's not stack safe. You basically can't write that using try finally, because try finally requires static scopes, static topology for resource allocation and deallocation. What about Zio? It's like, oh, okay, <laughs> no problem at all, right? It's super simple. And it doesn't matter, the, the topology of your resource allocation can be dynamic and it can actually depend on runtime values, which allows you to solve problems like this as well as much more complicated problems. This is a list, right? But imagine trees and other complicated forms of allocating and deallocating resources that are trivial for Zio, no problem at all for Zio, but impossible with try finally. And this leads to another drawback, which is uh, the linearity, intense linearity of try finally. 
Like not only are the uh, resor resources allocated sequentially, but they're freed sequentially. And you can't change that, okay? Because um, if you want the guarantee that Tri finally has, you wanna open two things, you will open them one after the other, and you will close them in reverse order. That's the way it will work, always. And there's no escape hatch. And of course, in Zio, we can not only parallelize the opening of these two things and never leak resources just by using Zippar or whatever, but we can also parallelize the finalization of these things. Parallelizing finalization is not always something that you want to do because sometimes one thing depends on another. But when it is what you want to do, it's a one-liner. So what do you think? JDK or Zio? Yeah. Zio? Probably Zio. Right? Okay. Global state. What I mean by global state is state that multiple threads or virtual threads in your application need to modify. And it's easy enough to, using virtual threads, modify uh, global state. <clears throat> you just create a counter, for example, and you spin up two virtual threads to increment it. But that's broken, isn't it? It's broken due to race conditions. Operations like increment are not atomic which means that there are consistency issues in attempting, in general, in, in virtual threads or, or non-virtual threads, there are consistency issues in multiple threads attempting to update the same mutable state. So what's the solution that we have for that in JDK? It's that? Say? That won't solve it either. <laughs> no, that solves uh, cache um, volatility or, or cache staleness issues, but it won't solve the uh, clobbering issue. We'll get to Atomic Ref in a second, but there's something older that's uh, more powerful. Synchronize, or more generally, LOX, right? LOX synchronizes a, a mutex, a reentrant mutex. Um, but more generally, if you want to generalize a reentrant mutex, you end up with something like a lock. And locks are, they get the job done. And if you read any book on concurrent programming, you're going to find out what's the difference between an ordinary lock and a reentrant lock and a semaphore and a mutex and this and that. You'll discover a whole world of documentation out there that lets you solve problems involving global application state. And you can write code that allows you to safely, with fairly strong guarantees, mutate shared state, which is essential in, any, in many different types of large-scale concurrent applications. Even if you aren't doing something like this yourself, you're using you know, a web framework, it's definitely doing stuff like this uh, underneath the covers. So Zio has an alternate for locks, and that's called a ref. And a ref basically gives you a, a ref is a mutable cell, or, or more precisely, it's a model for a mutable cell that can store immutable contents. And that's really a beautiful fit for Scala because Scala gives us amazing tools to create immutable data models, sealed traits, enums, and case classes, which are immutable by default. So ref works really well with Scala data structures. And ref gives us the guarantees of atomicity consistency and isolation. And that's enough to allow us to modify shared state from across as many fibers as we want without having to worry that there's going to be consistency issues, clobbering, data clobbering issues, or, or uh, cache volat staleness issues. We're not going to have any of those issues using REF. And wait a minute, you say, REF is not unique to Zio. In fact, you're right, and this comes back to your suggestion, um, there's something called atomic reference in the JDK that has the same guarantees as Zio's REF. So it seems like a wash, right? You, you can get REF from Zio or you can get REF from the JDK. But if we look at a more sophisticated problem that's not going to be easily solvable with atomic reference or ref, so something that's going to require meteor tools to solve. Like, for example, let's, let's make uh, this problem um, such that we have two different accounts, two different like bank accounts or whatever, 
And what we want to do is, uh, for, for the one bank account, we want to transfer so much money from that bank account to the second bank account. But we only want to do that when there's enough money in the first bank account. And what we want to do that in such a fashion that ensures that if anyone looks at either bank account state, it's consistent. It's globally consistent. There should never be any period of time, even a nanosecond, in which, for example, that $500 is nowhere because it's been debited from one but not yet added to the other. Um, or when it's you know, been added to the, the second one, if that were to happen first, and also still in the first one. Right? We never want that to happen. We want to be globally consistent. And if we were to do this using locks, the first challenge we run into is locks are super sensitive to order of acquisition. So if, you, if we have code in our system that acquires a lock on account one and then account two, and then other code in our system that acquires both of those locks as well, but in the reverse order, that's a deadlock. And you might think, well, I can just look at my code and I can tell wh whether or not everyone is acquiring the locks in the right. No, you can't because like, for example, in this one, it's symmetrical, right? If both of those people engaged in a transfer at the same time, um, then from like the point of view of the code, it would be acquiring this one first and that one second, but it would be inverse order. And also you never know, you're calling this function, which is calling that function, which calls that function, which acquires this lock, which happens to block that. Building concurrent systems using locks, it's really hard because you easily run into deadlocks. And actually building lo or, um, locks are not enough to solve this problem. Locks let you solve synchronization problems. They let you say, okay, we're gonna take turns. And uh, no one's gonna be able to modify account one until they have the lock. Only one person can have the lock at a time. So one person just grabs both locks and now they can modify both accounts and then they release them. That's a synchronization problem, but the other thing you need to solve this is a uh, coordination problem. Because you need to wait until there's enough money in account one balance. And there's something else in the JDK that's really good at solving this. Has anyone ever used it? Do you know what it is? Condition variable. It's a condition variable. Condition variables can be used to solve coordination challenges in concurrent programming. And how they work is once you have a lock, you create a new condition variable. And there's only two operations you can do with a condition variable. You can await for it to be signaled, and you can signal it. I mean, there's variations of those, but those are the two fundamental operations. That allows you to solve coordination problems because I can create a new condition and you can wait on it until I decide to signal it. And this allows us to write code that solves this problem, but it's super tricky. First off, you can never call any of those two methods on a condition unless you have the lock. Right? Then you also need to decide when is the right point to call signal. And are you going to call signal or are you going to call signal all? Trust me, you don't even want to know the difference between those two. <laughs> or how about with the timeouts, the timeout variance? Using conditions is very tricky. It's easy to get it wrong. There's nothing to help you. On the other hand, Zio gives you something called software transactional memory, which there's plenty of talks out there on Zio's STM. The idea comes from Haskell. It's beautiful. It's an amazing idea that lets you solve concurrency challenges like this one without even trying or really knowing anything about concurrency. You don't have to know anything about concurrency. In order to solve this problem using Java util concurrent, <laughs> you need to know your locks, your condition variables, your reentrant locks, spurious wakeups, all the stuff that can go wrong. You need to know that and you can come up with a, a decent solution. It's not going to be easy and it's going to be hard to maintain, but you can do it. Using ZOSTM, Everyone here in the audience could probably, you know, tonight create some sort of concurrent data structure that works as specified in five to 10 lines of code. That's how simple it is. To solve this problem, we just say, we wanna do a bunch of things atomically. And then we say, we wanna wait until the amount in the from account is greater than the amount we're transferring. And then that suspends the transaction until that condition is met. That replaces a condition variable. And then we subtract from one and we add to the other. And then we basically commit the whole thing in that atomically block. Done. Don't have to think about, this is declarative concurrency. 
And it gives us all the same benefits we get from ref, but it composes across multiple so-called T-refs, transactional refs. So JDK, well, everyone knows locks, but they're prone to deadlocks and they're not, they're not compositional. Actually, rather hard to use. Zio, it's using something new, imported from Haskell. And it requires learning. <laughs> you don't just, like, probably if you took an average comp sci grad, they would know about locks and they would be able to build their own semaphore or whatever, build some sort of concurrent structure using locks. Um, the same would not be true of STM. You need to understand what software transactional memory is all about, what an STM transaction is and what a TREF is, what the retry thing is and whatnot. It's not super complicated, but it's something you have to learn. And of course, you're doing it using monadic syntax, which is another drawback. On the other hand, you can create truly deadlock-free code. That does not mean your concurrent code will always complete. For example, bugs are bound to occur but it does mean you don't have to worry about deadlocks in particular. And then it's fully compositional transactions composed with other transactions. So you, you, it's very easy to maintain STM code. So what do you think? Who gets this round? <laughs> you could say JDK, by the way. You could, make, you could make the argument that even though it's hard to use, it's a higher performance, maybe. All right, local state. So what is local state? Well, sometimes it's not enough to update application state globally. We want to, we basically want to attach some state to a thread. And we want to say we only want to update the state in this thread. And a really perfect example of that is uh, tracking correlation ID. Sometimes in web requests, we attach some sort of ID so we can track our tra traffic across different microservices. And uh, so-called thread locals are a way of uh, attaining basically um, local state, state that is attached to a thread, or in the case of, of Loom, a virtual thread, because there's full support for using thread locals under Loom. And how that works is you just, you know, in one part, you know, at the beginning of your thread, for example, when you get an incoming web request, you set the correlation ID or whatever other bit of state you want, and then downstream, you can actually read from that variable. And every thread will read its own copy of that value. It's a great way to propagate information across linear sequences of instructions. Using thread locals, I mean, your logging libraries already use thread locals. Even if you don't know it, they, they use thread locals. But also, if you were propagating something manually downstream in your thread, Thread local would be a great way to do it. Unfortunately, there's a little problem, and that problem is made all the worse by Loom. The problem is Loom makes it so dang easy to start up new virtual threads. You can do that a million times. You, know, you, you could do it for every little thing inside a single uh, handling of a request. You can do it a million times. And guess what? Every time you spin up a new virtual thread, it will have its own copy of that thread local, which will be initialized to its default value, not the one that was sent in the thread that spawned it. Okay, so you have a, let's call it a parent thread. There are no parent-child relationships between threads in Loom, or, or obviously pre-Loom. But nonetheless, uh, let's just call it a parent thread. Parent thread spawns off 10 child threads all the 10 child threads get zeros, basically, for their thread locals, despite the fact that it was set in the parent thread. That is not pleasant. <laughs> it is not pleasant to be wrestling with nulls or default values in, in threads caused by some change to the code. Fortunately, the JDK has a solution to this problem. And the solution is a so-called inheritable thread local. And how in inheritable thread local works is Every time, um, well, basically, when a thread uh, spins up another thread, a child thread, its own thread locals are copied over into, deep copied over into the child thread's thread locals. And what this allows you to do is start propagating that correlation ID downward. 
And that's what you want. In general, you want that downward propagation. You want child threads to access values that were created or modified by the parents. It's not enough, though. There are actually some serious drawbacks to using that data type, the inheritable thread local, and one of which is that it's really, really slow. Why? Because, well, in Scala, it would be an immutable map, right? And, uh, and as an immutable map, every time you created a child thread, you would just hand it over. And you don't need to worry about mutation. But in Java, that list of thread locals and all the thread locals themselves, it's super mutable. So you just need to have to copy, 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 copy everything over, and that's allocation. That's pressure on the heap. That slows down your application. But also, thread locals are super leaky. Once you set a thread local, it stays set forever. Thread locals are not scoped. That means if you're creating more and more thread locals, then eventually you'll exhaust all memory in the heap. I mean, if you're only dealing with a finite set of thread locals, it's not as bad, but it could still be bad. It, it's definitely not ideal. And fundamentally, it doesn't solve what I would call the concurrent local state problem. What's that? Well, here's my iron law of principled concurrent state. So changes in concurrency should never affect the correctness of our programs. What does that mean? Let's take an example. Let's say we're trying to time different regions of our handler, our route handler, or maybe our data processing pipeline. And we want to understand, we want to break it down into this section and this section and this section. And I'm going to do this using Zio, but you could easily do it using thread local as well. And what I did is I created a, a class called timing that holds a map from phase of our application to how long it took to run that phase. And keep in mind, we might visit the same phase multiple times. That's why we have that map structured, so we can keep on incorporating information. And now we have a fiber ref in which we're storing timing information. And the idea here is that we're going to write an operator like this time. And that time will pass at a phase and a zero effect, and it will give us back another zero effect that will time how long that effect took and put it in the map, recording its duration under the corresponding phase key. Does that make sense? All right, so imagine we might use it like this. So we're updating our data set, and we want to time that, and we want to re record that under the update data set phase of our application. However, Update dataset may itself want to time a bunch of other things. There's no reason why we just want to time stuff at the top level, right? And deeper in our code, we're going to have more and more stuff we want to time. So we might update dataset might be structured like that. And then it's very easy for us to imagine a, a situation in which, okay, we're looping over a list of parameters and we're going to update the dataset for each of these parameters, right? And this will work. This will work using thread locals. The thread local version of this will work fine. What happens, though, when we switch that for each to for each par? What happens when we start doing those things in parallel? Everything breaks. <laughs> Not in Zio. Zio is the only solution out there where this actually works, but everything else breaks. And the reason is uh, super subtle. The reason is that even when you're using inheritable thread local, um, every child will get a copy of the timing from its parent. But then the, that updated version of the thread local will be forgotten about because it dies in the child, basically. The child has its updated copy, but that, the updated information in there doesn't make it back to the parent's thread local or fiber ref or whatever. Does that make sense why it, it doesn't work? And so look at, look at these two things, like, OK, I was doing my for each merrily along, and then I wanted to make it faster, so I changed it for each bar. And now suddenly, production is reporting that stuff is breaking. That's super sensitive in the worst possible way to changes that should be benign to the correctness of the application. This should have an effect on performance, for sure. 
or, or latency or whatever, it should not have an effect on correctness. And hence, now you, you might understand what I mean by this iron law of principled concurrent state. Any deviation from this law will surprise in a bad way. <laughs> this is not birthday surprise. This is a bad type of surprise end users at some point. So how does Zio make this work? Well, it's not so simple. <laughs> As we discovered in Zio 2 actually, it's taken us some time to get this right. Every concurrent operation in Zio is built on fork join. Ain't fork join. Fork spins up a new fiber and join merges its identity into a parent fiber. And that's, of course, very beautiful, and that's how you might implement a lot of things in Java, for example, with the fork join thread pool. Fork join does exist in Java. Exists, uh, it's called something else in Cat's effects, start and, and, and join, I think. Um, but those operations exist, but they're different in Zio. They're quite a bit different. And the differences start with FiberRef. FiberRef actually incorporates, the, first off, you can create your own FiberRefs to describe things like timing. And when you create a fiber ref, you can actually describe a patch algebra that applies to values of that type. And a patch algebra allows you to diff two things to produce a patch and also apply a patch to one of those things to get back the new version. It's governed by algebraic laws and it's very similar to the technology used in real-time collaborative editors or even in some version control systems that allows you to sanely deal with concurrent modifications. Remember, real-time collaborative editors and version control systems have to solve this problem. They have a concurrency problem. Multiple people editing the same code or the same Word doc or whatever at the same time, they have to solve these concurrency, concurrent state challenges. And they've developed very robust ways, powered by mathematics, actually algebra, in order to solve these problems, and that's what Zio does. FiberRef is an algebraic structure that allows you to define rigorously principled ways of diffing and patching values of a certain data type. And that's not enough, actually. Uh, every time you fork a fiber, basically, um, we need to uh, track the relationship between fibers, just like when you fork a a Git repository and you append some commits to it, and then you fork that and then you append some, that's a tree. And that tree information is tracked by Zio when it needs to be. There's shortcuts to avoid tracking things that don't need to be tracked. But it's tracked by Zio, and it enables when um, a parent fiber joins the child fiber, there's a diff produced based on those, the values of those fiber refs, and that leads to a patch, which is then incorporated into the parent's version of that ref. What that means is you can change between for each and for each par or zip and zip par or whatever, you know, do things in parallel or do them sequentially, it doesn't matter. If you've defined those fiber refs correctly, then everything just works out beautifully and it's guaranteed to work out. You know, if you satisfy the laws, it's guaranteed to work out beautifully. And this, this um, patch algebra actually underpins the basis of the ZO2 runtimes that we would not be able to even <laughs> have a runtime says we, we had so many problems until we figured out what was going on and were able to introduce this. It was a big breakthrough for us because finally we felt like we understand the true essence of concurrent shared state. It's, we've made concurrent shared state principle in a way that it's not, not in Haskell, not in Java, basically nowhere else. And what this means is that you can focus on the logic of your code and you don't have to worry about your little changes from parallel to sequential are not going to break things in production. All right, so pros and cons, as you see, who do you want to give this one to? <laughs> kind of sounding like a broken record here, right? Zio, Zio, Zio. It's a foregone conclusion who's going to win this thing, right? Type safety. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> right, skip past this one. <laughs> you know where this one goes. <laughs> Java in the old days at least paid lip service to type safety and errors with checked exceptions. But like Adam Worski pointed out, there's some serious drawbacks to checked exceptions in Java. And it feels to me like, you know, well, first off, uh, callable 
lets you throw an exception, but it's not typed. It's just generic exception. And looking at all the stuff in Loom, it really feels to me like they decided, yes, checked exceptions were a failure. We're not even going to try to deal anything with typed errors. So you can look around in Loom at all the stuff in the structured concurrency and whatnot, and, and even the virtual thread stuff, it's like they're, they're moving more and more away from even the simple forms of tracking exceptions that we had in earlier versions of the JDK. They're just not supporting them. So, you know, from my point of view, as, as a fan of not just typed success values, but typed failures, I view that as, as a failure <laughs> because we're throwing information away. We can't understand as statically typed programmers, we can't understand our programs un unless we know what values they produce in the happy path. And also, we can't understand error behavior unless we understand what values, if any, they produce in the unhappy path. And Loom doesn't give us that. In runnable, callable, all of its sort of concurrent-like structures, it's just, it's not there. And uh, Zio takes a different philosophy. Zio takes a runnable, basically. The whole idea behind Zio is, Let's make runnable more type safe. So we replace the unit return value from runnable is basically just a, a function from unit to unit. We replace the return value with an A, and that becomes callable, which actually Java has. And it's very similar to like cat's IO or Monix or, or future. It's very similar. And then if we say, well, it would be nice to be able to uh, have a handle on that error, so we replace the return value by an either EA. And then we've got typed errors. And then if we want to replace the initial unit by another type, well, we get R to either EA, which is the shorthand mental model that we give people who are learning Zio. What does that mean? Well, Zio is clearly inevitable, right? Zio is what happens when you take something in Java and just make it type safe. And so Zio leverages this aggressively in errors. You look at a function signature and you know how it fails. And one of the interesting areas where this percolates that creates a, quite a problem, I think, in Loom is uh, threads. So threads are not typed. Basically, a thread is powered by a runnable. And because a runnable is not typed, a thread is not typed. If Loom had introduced something like a callable, but you know, callable EA, that would have been a game changer for type safety in Loom. It doesn't exist though, unfortunately. So runnable is still the basis of virtual threads, not just ordinary threads. And because of runnable is unit to unit, it means a thread is untyped. So when you start a thread, you have no idea, could this thread fail? And if so, how could it fail? And you have no idea what value the thread would produce. Well, I mean, it's not going to produce any value because it's typed to return void. And Zio takes the opposite approach, which is every time you have a bit of code, that bit of code produces a value. It might be unit, of course, but it produces a value, and it might fail with some value. And that information, in, uh, in effect, is translated into Zio's notion of a thread, which is fiber. Now, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between fiber and thread. Zio's fiber is JDK's thread, only it has two type parameters to tell you how the thread can fail and how it can succeed. So yeah, you, you know how this one is going to end. Not so well for the JDK, which does not really value such things. And, and also, to be fair, like thread was created a really long time ago. It's quite possible that if they had to redo it, which is not an option because they need to preserve backward compatibility, maybe they would decide to give threads some type parameters. But from what I've seen, the, the type safety is only going to decrease, unfortunately, with, with the Loom stuff. All right, error management. So Loom gives us a, a try, catch, and finally, that work with async operations. So basically blocking of these virtual threads. All of these things work great. And, and that was a compelling reason for some people to use functional effect systems because dealing with errors using callbacks is really nasty and it's very easy to forget to pass some error callback in and to lose an error. 
and, and try catch, everyone knows how to use that. So it's really a compelling way for us to improve the quality of our applications, just getting away from the callback style and, and either using something like Zio or just jumping straight into Loom. Now, when we are talking about uh, concurrent operations, then we need to consider what mechanism are we going to have to ensure that we don't drop errors on the floor. If we spin up five threads and all five of them fail, but we weren't listening, well, what, what are we gonna do about that? And the solution to this problem in JEP 428 is uh, structured concurrency, basically. And this allows you to have some form of concurrent, concurrency aware error aggregation or handling logic. It's a solution to the problem. I spun up a bunch of things, but I wanna make sure I do the right thing when some or all of those things fail. But getting that right is very hard. And if Loom didn't have anything like this, if it were always just start virtual thread of unit to unit, and those errors would go into a black hole and there would be no way of getting that information out at higher levels. So here we spin up a new structured task scope and we, we call scope fork on that. And then the structured task scope itself is able to um, more or less figure out what to do with the errors. And, and the default one doesn't do any, anything interesting, but there's two subtypes of this that do some interesting things. And if you want to make your own, you simply override structured task scope and you implement a handle complete method that will be passed a future, a Java future of that type. And that future allows you to look at errors and success, success cases and either collect those errors if you want all of the errors of the subtasks out, or maybe fail fast if you want to fail on the first error, or maybe, maybe ignore failures and just keep successes. Basically, this is your ticket to achieving any type of error handling you want under Loom using structured concurrency. And, and you can, pretty much. I can't think of anything you can't manually, painfully, using the huge amounts of boilerplate code do using this API. This, on the other hand, is Zio's philosophy of error management. You zip two things together, and if for some reason they both fail, both errors will be preserved. Zio has a lossless philosophy with regard to errors. He wants to hold on to all the errors and never lose them throughout all the concurrent operations. He wants to aggregate them and expose them to you directly, automatically, and for free. You call some other concurrent operator like race await, which races two sides and, and waits for the loser to be interrupted. And it too, if both of them fail, it's going to collect both typed errors and give them back to you. And not just the typed errors, but maybe you have defects in your code, you have failures in your finalizers, or this and that. All of that information will be collected. It's collected into a data structure that Wiem actually introduced earlier in her keynote this afternoon called Cause. Cause is a lossless representation of the full story of how a concurrent process ended its life in failure. Looking at this cause, you can see there's a parallel cause and a sequential cause in the first branch, which is an ordinary type failure caused by a sort of catastrophe, probably a cert violation or something with the illegal argument exception. And then also one of the parallel causes was uh, the fiber, the, the thread running this code was interrupted at the same time as all these other errors were happening. All that information is there. And if that weren't enough, if you fail to handle any errors, if you just, for example, spin up into a new virtual thread, you spin up a new uh, Zio fail or whatever, so you don't handle your own error, basically, then that's automatically logged for you using whatever logging library you've integrated using Zio log. So there's probably no comparison here. Just looking at the amount of code necessary to aggregate errors in JDK is just 
awful. And with Zio, you get all of that for free. Uh, types, because types are really the foundation of this. Those types, as well as the cause data structure, which captures the full story on er errors. All right, concurrency. Yeah, we're gonna, I'm gonna go fast because I'm out of time. <laughs> so, <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, so we wanna do two things in parallel. You can't do that with thread because thread has no type parameters. So how do you do it? Well, structured concurrency is the answer. So you use a structured task scope. Structured task scopes provide a scope that can be used with try with resources, allowing you to spin up a number of virtual threads and have the existence, the lifespan of those threads be determined by the scope. And different subtypes will do different things with the, the child fibers, the fibers that are, have been forked in that scope. This is how structured concurrency works. In, um, in, in JEP 428, and it allows you to not leak threads, among other things, as well as aggregate errors and basically have a little supervisor on top of those. And uh, it's, it's interesting that you have to use all of this stuff. You have to opt in to structured concurrency, and you have to be very, very explicit about it in Loom. And in, in Zio, a, a little known fact, actually you will eventually learn it probably, because of the, uh, auto supervision kicking in where you didn't want it to. But uh, Zio has structured concurrency by default. Every time a fiber creates child fibers, those are actually ch children of the parent. And when the parent ends life, so also do the children. That happens automatically with Zio. You don't need to do anything. You can change that if you want. If you've seen Fork Damon or Fork Scope, you know the two different variants of that. But by default, you get structured concurrency. You don't even have to know what structured concurrency is. It's just gonna do the right safe thing. Uh, here's an example of race in the JDK, and uh, it is, it's not great. Um, it, there's no way to time it out, and it actually leaked threads. I'll return to that in a moment. With Zio's version of race, it's super easy to time out in a compositional fashion, and it doesn't leak. Here's uh, another example of us trying to do a, a bunch of things in parallel, and that's not so easy. I'm sure a Loom expert could find a simpler way to write that, but it's not gonna be fun. At the end of the day, you wanna do a bunch of things in parallel in Loom, and you're looking at a lot of unpleasant code. And in Zio, uh, I might be biased, but this looks simpler to me. All right, so uh, the good news about interruption is that you can try to do that uh, using, uh, or, or you, could, you could do that, or timeouts, timeouts in Loom, is you can just spin up a virtual thread which can sleep for a certain amount of time, and then it can manually interrupt the other thread. So that's how you would do a timeout in Loom. And fortunately, the, three, the sleep there is super efficient. It's not gonna be consuming a platform thread like it would be on today's JDK. So it's very, very efficient. However, it's also not very reliable. And that's because, well, the Zio version, you can see it's super easy, timeout 60 seconds. The Zio version will reliably interrupt the thing that's running. The Loom version will not reliably interrupt the thing that's running. And uh, Right, <laughs> I don't have anything good to say, I'm sorry. <laughs> maybe, maybe there's something good, <laughs> maybe, maybe there's something good there, I don't have anything good to say. All right, real, real quick, thread leaks. Uh, thread leaks occur when you have repetition of code that leaks threads. And, and in the case of Loom, it would be virtual threads. Basically, if, if your operations, if your concurrent operations are insufficiently back pressured, if they don't wait for virtual threads to shut down, and you put them in a loop of any type, then you will be leaking threads. Just a question of how fast. It might not be a fatal thread leak, but you'll, you'll leak them. You'll have more threads running than you actually need at that point, point in time, which is a thread leak. And all of the structured concurrency stuff in Loom, it, it leaks threads, unfortunately. Uh, every single little bit of it leaks threads. It will be possible for you to implement your own structured task scope which doesn't leak threads, 
but will block your application maybe forever. So it's a trade-off. You can either choose to leak thread, which is probably the correct choice for Loom, or you, or you can choose to wait on a thread that may, in fact, be uninterruptible and may never yield by calling, for example, file input stream.read. So it's not very hard to do that. Very easy to get yourself into a situation where you have a thread that's never going to end life, and you can't really wait for it to end life. All of these things, they don't wait for threads to end. They're all inherently leaky. So threads leaking left and right, whereas Zio's race await operator back pressure. It waits till the loser of the race is shut down. Zio's zip par back pressure. It waits till the, uh, you know, if, if one of them fails, then the other one will be terminated, right? Because it can't zip them both in parallel if one of them fails. So it's going to wait until that one shuts down. And you can actually choose your semantic. You don't have to. Zio has operators like disconnect that let you disable back pressuring. So in order to back pressure on the right but not the left, we just disconnect the left. Or if we want to back pressure on the left but not the right, we just disconnect the right. Or if we don't want to back pressure anywhere, we want Loom World, right? We, we want, we know we want to leak our threads. Then we just disconnect both sides and we get exactly the semantic that we want. We can choose whatever behavior we want and it's not 20 lines of implementing structured task scope. It's dot disconnect. All right, 10 commandments of JDK's interruption model. Sorry, Alexander, are you here? So you can appreciate this? No, he's not even here. Why did I do this? <laughs> Interruption's a Boolean flag inside a thread. You set the, I'm just going to skip over all of them. Um, and I'm going to leave you with the 10th commandment, which is really the only important one, which is thou shalt never, ever rely on Java's interruption model for achieving correct concurrency, because it's broken, <laughs> irreparably broken. Zio's interruption model instantaneously propagates downward. You cannot catch interruption. You can only delay it. And you can only do that inside an uninterruptible scope. It integrates cleanly with resource handling. It fixes all of the problems that Java's thread interruption model has. And it's built on work. I mean, not just the Java interruption model, but Haskell and, and more besides. Retries and reps. Well, good news is you can actually do retries and, and repetitions scheduling using thread sleep, because that becomes super efficient under Loom. The bad news is. Well, look at it. It's awful. And Zio, like I, I, I didn't want to, it would not fit the amount of code necessary to do exponential back off starting from 10 milliseconds up to 60 seconds. Even that simple schedule there wouldn't fit in this slide, like in any font size. So I didn't even try that. I gave you 10 repetitions, which is about what you can fit on a slide using the JDK. And a scheduling, it works this way. It's compositional, it's algebraic. It gives you extraordinary power. These things have structure, algebraic structure, schedules composed algebraically and geometrically in intuitive ways that don't surprise you. They don't have edge cases. Well, I hope not. We fix bugs, so <laughs> not anymore, hopefully. Uh, so retries and reps, you know, JDK just doesn't give you the tooling necessary to build resilient. Yes, you can build it yourself. No question. And it's going to be efficient. But it's uh, not going to be fun. And you're going to be spending some time to do that. And then finally, round 10, I'm going to very rapidly walk through some code that I would, if you're a Loom fan or JDK fan, I would challenge you to write using JDK. Let's start off for each and doing a loop over a bunch of requests and making a GraphQL call. Let's do that in parallel. Let's limit the parallelism to a factor of 10. Let's actually retry the GraphQL call using exponential backoff, starting with 10 milliseconds. Let's continue that exponential retry up until the point where the spacing between the recurrences exceeds 60 seconds. Let's time out the entire process um, using uh, timeout error. And then let's map over the results of collecting all of the calls to make GraphQL call. We're going to collect them all, and we're going to aggregate them together into a single response. I did that in one slide. <laughs> How many slides do you think it would take you to do that in JDK? 
<laughs> I don't think they, they make a font small enough to do that in one. Uh, and, and this, lossless errors, zero resource leaks, works pre-loom or post-loom. And it's so easy to maintain. You could tell me that I have to change this in some fashion and I would just tweak it. And, and it would just work. That's, that's the power. That's a mic drop in my opinion. <laughs> And one more little example, let's just race two things and wait until the loser's terminated. Well, no, let's actually um, back pressure on the right, um, but not the left. Oh no, uh, let's, uh, let's race the result, right? So ordinary race, it will give us the first success. But what if we want the first result, whether success or failure, it's dot exit. So we just dot exit both of them and we erase that, and now we'll get back the first success or failure from either side. And then let's disconnect the left-hand side so we're only back pressured on the right-hand side. And then let's make the left side interruptible, but not the right-hand side or the race or any of that machinery. Then let's retry the right-hand side using some sort of sophisticated policy. And then let's time out the entire process by 60 seconds, right? <laughs> <laughs> You, you can't, you're not brave enough, right, to do that in, on, in the JDK. I know I'm not brave enough to do that in the JDK because I can't imagine how many hundreds of lines of code would be necessary, and I would not be even confident that it's correct. But to do that in Zio, it's just so easy, and it just works, and it has the correct semantics that it should have. <laughs> yes, right. <laughs> right, Spring will invent annotations to do that maybe one day, maybe. All right, so... Here we are, about ready to close this out. And looking at code like this, you, you know, on the one hand, I'm grateful to Loom for giving us the power of virtual threads, which will be used in all libraries. Zio is very much ahead and like betting on Loom to succeed with the, the design of its runtime system. I'm very happy. And I think it's going to make Java viable for many more use cases, right? It's gonna, make sure that people don't leave it for something like Go, which already has green threads. You know, modern languages have green threads. Java did not, but now it does. So it, it, it makes the JVM remain very, very relevant, and, and JVM has lots of ecosystem benefits as well. But looking at code like this, it's just, okay, you, you know it's leaky, right? You know it's, it's, hard to, it's hard to write code like this, and like uh, everywhere you just see errors like this, I mean errors, disadvantages, whatever you want to call them, like this version of race which conflates racing things with a timeout. It conflates them. It's a single method that forces us to specify a timeout here while we're doing the race. And it has to do that. This is a key observation, a key takeaway that I want you to, to have tonight is it has to do this because race returns a value. Race computes the value and then returns it. Once you return a value, you can't time it out. It's too late to time it out, you already have it, right? So there's nothing to time out here. And it's not really what we want, right? We, if we have a bunch of nested race, we don't wanna time out the, the one that's way down there. Like we wanna time out something, but it's gonna be a composition of many, many other things. We don't want our code down here to be concerned with a timeout because of implementation detail, because of the fact that race returned a value rather than an effect. And ultimately, that's what it comes down to is that the JDK is based on statement-oriented programming, procedural programming, as I call it. And when you have a statement, there is no way to transform it. It just is what it is. The notion of transforming statements does not make sense. Right? A statement is a statement. There's no way to combine statements. Well, there's one way to combine statements. That's the semicolon operator. That's sequence. Do this first, and then do that. Those are the tools that procedural programming gives you. No statement transformations, and only one way to combine two statements. That's sequence. That's it. Is it any wonder that it's so hard to program concurrent applications if you have no tools other than the semicolon. On the other hand, Zio turns statements into first-class values called effects. 
And effects can be transformed. You can transform one effect to another effect. You can take one effect and return another effect that will time out the first one. And also, effects can be composed in more ways than just one. We can race them, we can run them in parallel, we can run them sequentially, we can do a million other things with them. Zio is powerful because it is its own language for the design of concurrent systems equipped with transformations and composition operators that don't exist and cannot exist in a procedural world. Ron Pressler recently uh, wrote me on Twitter saying, Scala's approach to concurrency doesn't work. With all due respect, Ron, I would like to propose that Java's approach doesn't work more. <laughs> Composition lies at the heart of every great functional programming library. Whether that's Zio or some parser combinators library or, or lenses, optics, composition lies at the heart of all of it. And I would suggest that reflecting back to Adam Worski's keynote yesterday, it is not really, not really, fundamentally, it's not really tracking that gives effect systems their power. And tracking is not why I use an effect system. And I honestly think that at the end of the day, it's probably not why most of you use an effect system either. We use an effect system because they turn statements into values, ordinary values, and then they equip these values with extraordinary power. Ways to transform them to other values, ways to combine them that solve problems in the domain of building modern, highly scalable, concurrent cloud-native applications. They let us solve an infinite number of complex problems in simple and beautiful ways modular ways that we can maintain, that we can understand, that we can test, we can get our minds around. That's the power and promise of functional programming. It's not all rainbows and sunshine. <laughs> because to do FP, you know, to, to use statements as values, we gotta learn a thing or two, right? But what's the alternative? I, some of us might say the alternative is worse. That's up to you to decide. Different people will draw different conclusions. But I would encourage all of you, like to your coworkers and to people who are looking over into the world of Scala, encourage them to learn a new thing because if they do, they might just become substantially more powerful programmers than you could ever be in a world where your only tool is the semicolon. That's all I have for you. I want to thank you all for attending this talk. Thank you to the organizers for working so hard to put on this event. Thank you to our sponsors for uh, helping to make this event possible. And also to Zio contributors, especially Adam Frazier and Daniel Vygovsky and Alexander Afi, who work close with me on many core Zio things. Zio users who have who have suffered with us and uh, given us lots of feedback, and we, we've turned that into hopefully better and better versions of the Zio library. And uh, I hope to see you all at the party tonight, which is right out there. Apologies for going over. <laughs> <laughs>